Our castaway this week, ladies and gentlemen, is a prima donna, a very celebrated British singer, Dame Maggie Tate. Dame Maggie, what was your plan in picking just eight records that may have to last the rest well, of your life? Please, Roy, can I ask you something? Um, don't call me Dame. I know I, it's a great honour and I'm very pleased to have it, but I would like you to call me just Maggie, just like everybody else. Thank you, I will. Now, now what was this plan? For the eight records, mm. well, first variety, because I have piano, singing, instruments, a bit of orchestra, so therefore I get a variety, and also a boy soprano. But first, I shall take Clifford Curzon with me, and his valse oublié of Liszt. Why do you choose this? Well, the, the, the delicate touch that he has, uh, it's really as if he has uh, butterfly wings attached to his fingertips. It's so beautifully played. Clifford Curzon and Liszt's Valsoublié number one. What's your second choice? The second is the boy soprano that I want to take with me. Uh, this record uh, would help me to keep in touch with pure sound. You mustn't forget that on a desert island there would be squawking parrots and nattering monkeys and it would be like pop music to me. <laughs> and that is something I want to get away from. 
Richard White as soloist with the choir of King's College, Cambridge, singing Stanford's Magnificat in G. Maggie, where were you born? I was born in Wolverhampton, musical in Staffordshire. Fam musical family? Did you hear a lot of music? Oh, I didn't hear a lot of music, but uh, I come from a musical family. Mm -hmm. My father was a, an, a very good amateur pianist. Yeah. And uh, from my mother's side, I inherited the voice. They all sang on my mother's side. Mm -hmm. you see. When did you start to study singing? Oh, when I went to Paris, I was sent to Paris by Walter Rubens, who heard me sing at a church here in Maiden Lane. And he said, oh, you must go to Paris and study with Jean de Reschke. Yes. I must have been about uh, 16 and a half. Mm -hmm. Jean de Reschke must have been not only one of the most distinguished singing teachers in Europe, but also one of the most expensive. He was very expensive. He charged eight guineas for 15 minutes. Really? And, of course, 75% uh, of his pupils naturally were made up of American yeah. girls. There were a few of us there. How long did you study with him? Two years and three months exactly. When I sang to him before being accepted as a pupil, he, uh, it was in his salon in his uh, house in the Rue de la Faisonderie, Paris, and he said, in two years, she will make her debut. And I said to myself, good gracious me, two years, I don't, I can only speak English. I don't know any foreign languages at all. I know nothing about singing. I know nothing about anything. But he was right, because it was two years and three months exactly, mm. and I made my debut in Monte Carlo. In opera? In opera, in Don Giovanni, it's yeah. Erlina. Mm -hmm. And before you were 20, you were singing leading roles at the Opera Comique in, in Paris? Yes. I shouldn't say that all of them were. I sang a lot of Mozart, of course, at the Opera Comique. Yes. And you studied the role of Melisande with Debussy himself? Yes. What was your first impression of him? Well, he was a very big man, very sombre-looking, and uh, black hair and black beard, very broad-shouldered. He was... He must have... If he stood upright, he must have been about six... over six feet. Mm-hmm. Was he easy to work with? Did you have any trouble with him? No, none at all. He was very easy to work with. To begin with, he never made any conversation. Whenever he came into the room for rehearsals, he went straight to the piano. He started rehearsing right away, and it went like that for an hour. And you know I went there for nine months, and he never even spoke anything to me, no, no conversation of any kind. Would you say he was a perfectionist? Uh, yes, very much so. Although I heard him say one day, Wagner and Mozart and everybody else, they don't know anything about music, you can tear up their music, and yet I sang his music to him exactly as Dereschke had taught me to sing Mozart. Mm. And it was for this perfection of Mozart singing that he, what he liked. Yes. And I, it's, it's always been a mystery to me, this business. Because people, whenever uh, you ask people to play Debussy, oh, I couldn't do that, I can't sight read Debussy, they said, and they all get frightened to death about it. But it's not at all, uh, it wasn't a bit difficult. Mm. I learned Debussy just the same as I learned a Mozart aria. Yeah. Where did you make your professional debut in this country? With Tommy, uh, with Sir Thomas Beecham, <laughs> I yes. should say, at His Majesty's Theatre with the British uh, National Opera Company mm. that he had. And in the Again Uni in Mozart. Yes. And in the United States? I went to the United States in 1912, I think, 1913, just before the war. To sing opera once again? Oh, yes, I went to the uh, Chicago Opera Company yes. there to so sing Cinderella with the, with the famous Mary Garden. Mm-hmm. Mary Garden, of course, had been the original Melisande. Yes. How did she take to, to meeting her successor? She didn't take to it very well. She wasn't very kind. She, I shouldn't say this, of course, but to me she was the real prima donna. <laughs> I don't know what that <laughs> means to you. <laughs> Let's have your third record. My third record is Flagstadt. I must have a record of Flagstadt because of this wonderful voice. And when I was near to her at the Mermaid Theatre, I learned how she used her body so beautifully. It was the 
timing and the in fact she had turned her body into a beautiful machine because nobody before or since I've heard breathe like Flagstead. She had the most wonderful breathing capacity. The closing passage of Brunhilde's immolation scene from Goethe Dammerung, sung by Kirsten Flagstad. Now, you spent the years of the First World War in the United States because you were more or less marooned there. When you came back to this country, you adopted a rather lighter type of work for a little while. Yes, I remember I wanted to come back home, and, of course, there was nothing here, nothing happening. The Cobham Garden was closed, I believe. Mm. And so I sent a cable to... Lionel Powell, the big impresario at that time, and said, must come home, please find me something to do. And by the next post, I received a cable saying, a messager is uh, having his opera, Monsieur Beaucaire, uh, presented here. What about it? And I said, yes. And I took up uh, tickets and the journey and everything, and got back here as fast as I could. Mm. Well, then that led, uh, of course, Booker. It went for six months, yes. and then we closed because there was a general strike or something. Then I went into the little Dutch girl, and uh, again, six months, general strike, and that closed. So I was forced back on the straight and narrow path of art. I had to go back to <laughs> into recitals and concerts. Mm -hmm. Then, in the 30s, your career seemed to come unstuck a bit. You, you, you hit a bad patch, didn't you, for a few years? Yes, exactly, because life was unsettled. and The, the bad 1930s, I believe they were called here. I don't know yes. what happened here in 1930s, something. Mm -hmm. Any, anyhow, yes. I read a great deal about the radio of America, mm. and I thought, well, why shouldn't I get into that racket over there. <laughs> well, I went there in 1937 and couldn't make any progress at all. Everybody said to me, oh, Miss Tate, but you mustn't forget you're forgotten here. Well, that was a challenge. It was a series of records that put you back on top, wasn't it? That came the year after, when Joe Brogan of the Gramophone Shop of New York suddenly uh, insisted on having the Debussy album Mm -hmm. And they were made, and I then that helped, you see, yes. to bring me back before the public again. A big comeback in the United States and international and success. And then, of course, more. 1940 came, and another war came. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. that's the way it goes. Well, let's have your fourth record now. What next? Uh, well, you know that I'm a radio and TV uh, fan, and lately I have missed... Uh, the um, cultured English voice speaking its own language. So I'm going to take a record of John Gilgood to bring back memories of how English should be spoken. And so let us hear John Gilgood, please. So John Gilgood, The Tempest. Now, Maggie, you kept singing at a pitch of perfection for over 50 years, long after most other singers had given up. What was your secret? Oh, the method of Jean de Reschke, of course. Nothing lives without method or tradition. When I say tradition, everybody fights shy of this word of tradition here in England. I don't know why. They, you see, they think that there have been squares when you use the word tradition. <laughs> and it's not true. Yes. Because no one can build a house that will stand unless they build it with tradition. Because if you don't build your plumbing right according to tradition, what's the good of the house? Mm. So that's what I say to some of the pupils who rather look at, uh, scornfully at me when I say tradition. You must learn your Mozart and learn tradition. Oh, did you continue to do daily vocal exercises, even if you were singing a role at night? Every day you have to, because uh, when you sing before the public, everybody lets their hair down, so to speak. And this is the time that you collect faults. Therefore, the next morning you must come back to the, to the rules, you see. Mm -hmm. You must do exercises. It's very essential for any singer, if they have any 
Uh, if they are real singers, I'm yes. talking. I'm not talking now about uh, demi amateurs, mm -hmm. you know. I'm talking about the real thing. And you'll find that they all do exercises every day. Now you're teaching yourself, of course. Well, I have been up to, but now I'm gradually letting, letting it go. Mm. I just uh, give a few hints here and there to my friends, that's all. Let's have another record. We've got to number five now. Oh, now I'm going to take Cachaturian's Waltz because I think that I shall have to exercise my body, so I want to dance round this island, and I must have this, I adore this waltz of this man, and uh, it inspires you to move and to dance, so let's have this one now. Catraturian's Waltz from Masquerade, conducted by the composer. Now we've got to number six, what next? Shall I be allowed to put one of my own on, Of Roy? course, of course. Well, I don't like doing it because it always seems like self-advertisement, you know, self and I don't like that. But anyhow, I don't think a little Offenbach will do us any harm. I'm going to ask for my little record of La Pericole. Tu n'es pas riche, tu n'es pas beau. Uh, I think it, uh, besides, it will uh, lighten us up a little bit because uh, all the rest of my program perhaps is a little heavy. I don't know, not the, not the last one, but um, let's have this just for a little bit of fun, a little bit of French. Tu n'es pas beau, tu n'es pas riche, from La Pericole, one of my favourites. You're a very practical person, aren't you? I don't know. Would you? I suppose the Scotch are being Scotch. I suppose I should be, but I don't think I am really. I I've don't been, know. I've been looking up some some cuttings about you, and I, and I find that you invented a fire extinguisher <laughs> once, and that you took a course during the war and became an expert mechanic, and you made yourself an expert on acoustics. All this sounds to me very practical indeed. Now, how well could you look after yourself on this island? I don't think I. No, I'm not going to this desert island to do anything at all. I'm not going to do anything. <laughs> well, you'll have to do something. I mean, you'll have to pick up some... No, some I shall play fruit. my records. Just go on playing my records. That's why I think you're awfully stingy, only giving us eight, you know. Back to music. What next? Let's, let's go back to music. Oh, now, I'm going to take a record of Heifetz playing the Claire de Lune of Debussy. I must have a bit of Debussy somewhere. And it is beautiful, dreamy. Claire de Lune is such a beautiful piano piece, anyhow. And I love Heifetz, because to me he's the, uh, a great musician. And there's one thing, you know, when we learn a piece of music, very, very well, and we know a piece of music, anybody knows a piece of music very well, we are inclined to put our own interpretation on it, instead of the composer. Now, if I can find a person like Heifetz, who gives me the composer, and still gives me the interpretation that suits my idea of that piece of music, then, of course, he's a god. And this is what I get from Heifetz. Heifetz playing Debussy's Claire de Lune. And what's your last record? Well, my last record will be um, Harry Seacombe. I want to have, I must have Harry Seacombe and his voice. I think it's the most wonderful voice, but of course we know Harry Seacombe as one of the goons and, you know, uh, comedy and uh, laughing and this and that and the other, making a fool of himself. Now, I want to hear him as an operatic singer, and I th have chosen the Nessun Dorma, isn't it, from Turandot, because he really is serious here, and this voice and this, uh, like Fleischstadt, He's got the volume and the quality together. I think this is a wonderful record to end my little seance with you, too. Harry Seacombe, Nessum Doma from Turandot. Now, three other things you have to choose. One disc out of the eight you've chosen, one luxury and one book. 
Oh, yes. Um, I have to think about this. Well, Roy, I must tell you right away. I shall break all rules and regulations. I shall not take a book. I shall stick to my eight records, but I shall take you and the whole of your library with uh, me to the desert island. So there are rules against this. <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, I can't help it. So this is this is kidnapping, is it? I, I, I don't know. You can call it what you like. <laughs> I don't well, mind. Thank you, Dame Maggie Tate, for letting us hear your Desert Island Discs. <laughs>